Hello students and welcome to the final video of Unit 3. There are some other problems in Unit 3 that we'll be covering in class, but I will not be doing videos for those. You need to come to class and attend for those. This video is about some stuff I have alluded to in the previous two video. What are some of the problems associated with the use and execution of fiscal policy and monetary policy? But I also want to talk about where are they strongest. I've made some references there as well. And so again, let's just go ahead and let's share the screen. And let's take a look at the slideshow here. I'll just kind of talk through this and I'll add some commentary as we go through. Both fiscal and monetary policy often work according to theory, but just as often they fail. Some it has to do with the fact that you've got actual human beings, men and women who are with their flaws and they don't make good judgments. Sometimes it's bad timing, sometimes it's a lack of cooperation between branches of the government, or maybe the public and financial system aren't cooperative. So we're going to break down policy failures by kind of policy and by category of failure. Fiscal policy has four different groups. There are timing delays. For about six months of a trend in the macroeconomy, the government will not recognize as a problem. You see, normally during the course of the year, we have seasonal variation. Spending tends to drop between January and April. It tends to rise May, June, and July. It drops August, September, October. It rises November, December, into early January of the next year. If we have three months, January to April, with spending dropping, that's not a problem necessarily. That might be a normal seasonal fluctuation. You don't want to fix it if it's not broken. But if spending keeps dropping May, June, July after it already dropped January to April, that's more than six months of a drop. We can now recognize, hey, the economy seems to be contracting or going to recession. So about six months of a recognition lag. The second lag is called the administrative or operational lag. This is six months to two years. Remember with fiscal policy, there is an act of Congress that must be passed and that doesn't happen quickly. The president does not veto the act of Congress. That's the time it takes for the policy to pass legislation, pass the White House and be officially in effect. That could take up to two years. Last but not least is the effectiveness lag. So it's called the impact lag. Six months to a year after the law is on the books, it takes a while for the spending changes or tax changes to accumulate and move spending in the direction and in the direction we want it to. So six months to a year before there's an impact. So we're looking at two years, four years, five and a half years between when a problem starts, a response is created, and then it has an effect. And the economy is a dynamic organism. The economy could self-regulate while Congress is debating. And fiscal policy designed to fix one problem may end up causing a different one when it has an impact. This is not a difficult problem to come around or to fix, though, because all you have to do is put an escape clause in the legislation that would effectively repeal it if there's enough of a change in the economy. This is something that has been put in a lot of legislation since the early 2000s, and it has had some positive results of repealing laws before they actually had a bad impact. Now, political problems. Because politicians are in charge of fiscal policy, they sometimes engage in wasteful spending on projects that don't do any good. We call that pork barrel spending. A lot of members of Congress and legislators prefer to use expansionary policy. Hey, I cut uh, a bunch of income taxes and I raise spending on a bunch of programs you like. People see that, they want to vote for that guy. That's the public's fault. We prefer that they use expansionary policy, but if there's inflation, you shouldn't use expansionary policy. Sometimes you have other goals, ulterior motives. You say you're, you're opposing this legislation because it's bad, but really it's like you don't want your opposition party to get a, a win off of that. Or other times you want to get reelected, so you'll support a policy that's not appropriate because it makes you politically more popular. And in fact, we are still kind of dealing with the aftershocks of the political business cycle of the election of last year. Aye, aye, aye. Usually surrounding a federal election, especially presidential, the economy runs a lot rougher with a lot of bad policies surrounding the election as people are trying to curry favor with voters. The United States, believe it or not, has a relatively less corrupt government than some other nations do. If you compare the United States to some other developed nations, like, say, Mexico, for example, South Korea, we don't have the same level of corruption as they do. But, of course, people take a look at Norway and Sweden and say that they're less corrupt than the United States. But it's, it's all relative. Uh, compared to many other governments, the U.S. is relatively less corrupt. And the thing is, trying to suggest to anybody we should have a group of people that are multi uh, points of view that decide on taxes and government spending, and the president and Congress can do it, and oh yeah, you can't vote for those people, they're like the Supreme Court. Everybody's going to pitch a fit and say, no way do I want somebody in charge of my taxes that I can't vote out of office. 
Well, that's the price you pay. Now, the two more severe problems are the bottom two, crowding out of gross private domestic investment. Remember, when the government sells bonds, it is borrowing money from financial investors. If the government borrows money from domestic investors by selling bonds to American people and businesses, what ends up happening is gross private domestic investment spending ends up dropping or is crowded out as a result. We're going to look at this one in more detail in a minute. Other times, the government doesn't want to crowd out domestic investment spending, so if it borrows money to increase spending during a recession, it will sell bonds to foreign entities, foreign people, foreign businesses, foreign banks, foreign governments. It prevents the crowding out effect, but there's a whole bunch of other problems when you start borrowing money from foreign sources, and we're going to look at those as well. Crowding out of gross private domestic investment. It's the result of the government borrowing money through the domestic sale of securities. Domestic means sold to American people and businesses based in the U.S. The situation arises when we have a recession and the government tries to fix it using expansionary fiscal policy. In, when the government has a recession to deal with, they have to borrow money in order to increase spending because you can't raise taxes during a recession in order to fight that recession, spending your wheels in the dirt. The government sells securities, savings bonds, treasury bills, treasury notes, etc., to financial investors domestically. But the thing is, when they are sold domestically, they compete with small businesses trying to raise venture capital. They compete with corporations trying to sell a, uh, pardon me, uh, initial purchase offering or IPO of new shares of stock to say finance corporate, you know, uh, business equipment or corporate bonds are sold, or maybe you've got smaller businesses that are trying to raise venture capital. They're all comp in competition with each other. But here's the situation. If a corporation goes bankrupt, those bonds can be worthless. Those stocks can be worthless, but the U.S. government, knock on wood, is yet to ever default on its debt. And the thing is, during a recession, financial investors want to avoid risk in if the government is offering some new bonds, especially if they sweeten the pot by paying a higher rate of interest, more financial investors will buy U.S. government securities. Fewer financial investors will buy private stock, private uh, corporate bonds, venture capital investment. And so gross private domestic investment spending is going to drop as government spending rises, or in other words, it's going to crowd it out. Okay, and so this is going to mean fiscal policy may not work as well as you think it will. And I've got some illustrations of this over here. What you see on the left is the after recession graph we were showing for fiscal policy. The government says we're going to sell $750 billion worth of bonds. We're going to increase spending $750 billion. AD curve is going to move very far to the right. We're going to start to see the economy recover. We're going to see a big increase in real GDP and a big drop in unemployment. But then an economist shows up to spoil things and says, hang on a second, I just ran your numbers. You sold those bonds domestically. This is going to cause a $350 billion drop in gross private domestic investment spending because of the offset of the loss of corporate stock and bond sales and venture capital. Total spending will not increase $700 billion. It's going to increase $350 billion. So yeah, the AD curve moves to the right and we have an increase in real GDP, but it's nowhere near as big as you say it's going to be. And on top of that, you've got a bunch of people now, whoever's benefiting from those, the government programs being spent, they're now government dependent. You're going to have to find a way to wean them off of it later on. The whole thing is this is a visual illustration that shows that fiscal policy won't work as well because of the crowding out effect. Now, some people are going to say, well, the end justifies the means. If spending increases and there's less unemployment, doesn't that, the only thing that matters? Well, Certain workers and businesses are going to be more dependent upon the government. We're going to see a lot less growth in the private sector. Businesses won't grow as well. And we're going to see, as you saw in the graph, a diminished effectiveness of fiscal policy. Now, that's just the immediate short term, the next year or two. Over the long haul, over the next decade, it's going to be worse. Private sector growth will be a lot less. Some company tried to sell bonds in the short term to build a factory. That factory was never built. That factory could have employed people for the next 10 years and earn a lot of income. Never going to happen. Completely lost. All because of the crowding out effect. The government cannot sustain increased levels of spending forever. They're going to either have to raise taxes or they're going to have to cut spending or do some of both. Take a look at what happened to Greece. Portugal and Italy, especially Greece in the last several years, where they kept borrowing and spending and borrowing and spending, and their national debt was 13 times the size of their GDP. Aye, aye, aye. 
The U.S. has an excessive natural debt. It's the largest one in the world, but the thing is, it's just a little bit bigger than our GDP. It's not 13 times our GDP. The bottom line is if we don't do something about this national debt now, you're going to see a lot less government spending on programs, higher rates of interest. You're going to see a lot higher tax rates, especially. People are going to have to bite the bullet. In Greece, they had forced austerity measures to deal with that. Now, again, this still adds to the national debt, but sometimes what happens is the government decides to internationalize it. They decide to sell bonds to foreign governments, foreign businesses, foreign people. They do this to avoid the short-run crowding out effect on investment spending. It also means that foreign agents that own our bonds don't want to sabotage the economy because they want to earn their interest, and it provides the infusion of money to stimulate the economy. However, one of the reasons why some foreign governments will sell will buy U.S. bonds is it makes the dollar's value rise in terms of their currency, which makes their trade surplus fatter or makes our trade deficit fatter because of the dollar gaining value versus foreign currency. Also, when you think about it, interest payments on those debts will leave the United States and they'll be used to build up other countries. China last year earned over $50 billion in interest on bonds it holds from the American government and they used the $50 billion to put in new trains and new roads all over China. We've also seen stuff about Russia and China messing around in our elections. Well, part of the reason why sometimes they justified their doing this is, well, the U.S. government owes us a lot of money. We want to make sure we can collect on those debts and collect our interest. And so we don't want somebody voted into office who will basically default on that debt. We're protecting our interests. Now, if this sounds familiar to some of the older students, the U.S. was saying this when they were messing around in Panama and Nicaragua and El Salvador. They said that these countries borrow a lot of money for infrastructures. We want to make sure that whatever government's in charge will repay that debt. Not so much fun when you're on the receiving end of that. You want to see more about the national debt, take a look at the U.S. debt clock. We'll look at that one in class, but the thing is it's going to make your head spin. I warned you. Now, a few other problems of note about fiscal policy. It's hard to fight inflation because contractionary fiscal policy is politically unpopular. Unless you've got somebody that can just sell it and doesn't care what the voters think, it's not going to be utilized. It does work. It's hard to reach consensus unless one political party dominates the White House and the House of Representatives. If you have that control of Congress and the White House, it's easy to pass legislation. But because of all the stuff that happens with the legislative process, you have a potentially long administrative or operational lag. Now, monetary policy. We've already mentioned the fact that monetary policy works indirectly. The Fed cannot change total spending directly. It can only change M1 and interest rates. But again, the public and the banking system may not cooperate. And the Fed can't hold a gun to their head to make them. Easy monetary policy just does not work to fight a recession. Reason, usually during a recession, interest rates drop on their own, and the Fed makes them even lower, and banks don't want to lend money at low rates of interest. And then, during a recession, okay, on top of that, you know, people are more likely to lose a job, people are more likely to default on loans, banks don't want to lend money to people at low interest rates who may not be able to repay it, and the Fed can't hold a gun to their head and say, lend this money or else, not going to happen. The Fed also has placed limits on open market operations, and this was an issue prior to 9-11. The U.S. government had paid down some of its national debt, and the Federal Reserve hit 30% of the U.S. federal debt, and they won't hold more than 30% of it. The public and the banking system can counteract tight monetary policy, however. Some people have no financial discipline. They don't care how high the rate of interest is. All they know is they have a credit line, and they're going to use it. And banks live to loan money to people at high rates of interest. On top of that, usually there's inflation, stock prices go up, and people will liquidate them through selling them through online trading like Ameritrade. People will be more likely to liquidate bonds or even maybe use secured forms of loans like a mortgage loan or a home equity loan because they have lower rates of interest even when interest rates are rising. And again, if the banks loan enough to people with no financial discipline or people substitute down to secured financing, if too many people liquidate their stocks, M1 will not decrease as much as the Fed wants it to, so the Fed has to get aggressive. The Fed is going to have to use excessively tight monetary policy to make sure spending will drop. The end result is we may have had inflation, but if the Fed gets too aggressive, there's the danger of causing a recession. Now, of course, people hear about these problems and they say, well, wait a minute. Do these policies have any strengths? Why are we using them if they have all these problems? Well, they do have strengths. We wouldn't use them if they only had failings. But policymakers, 
need to keep the failings in mind and keep the potential downsides in mind if, prior to the use of macro policy. Fiscal policy directly affects total spending. You change government spending, you change GDP. You change income taxes, you change consumer and gross profit investment spending. It will directly change total spending. It will directly shift the AD curve. And when you have a recession, and if you've got a recession where the leading indicators say spending is going to keep dropping, which means it's long-lasting, expansionary fiscal policy is the only thing that's consistent to help with a long-lasting recession. And that's proof based upon history. For monetary policy, tight monetary policy has proven consistently affected to fight inflation ever since it's been incepted and at different points in time in history. Five people to seven people that make up the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and they decide primarily on, on uh, excuse me, um, the reserve ratio and other types of policy changes. You've got 10 to 12 people in the open market committee, they decide open market operations and interest rate policy. It's a lot easier to reach consensus with five to 12 people. There are 536 people involved with fiscal policy, one president, 100 senators, and 435 members of the House of Representatives. Easier to reach consensus. When monetary policy works, it is implemented, put into use, in other words, faster than fiscal policy. We don't have the timing delays of fiscal policy, but again, that's partly an outflow of fewer people. The Federal Reserve does not cause national debts to go up or go down. Fiscal policy can change the government's debt structure, make the national debt increase or decrease, and have spillover effects. The Federal Reserve Board is not elected. The president may nominate people to the Reserve Board, and the Senate may confirm them. And if they're subpoenaed to make a report to the president of Congress, they must. But the president can't say, I order you to lower interest rates. Uh, the new uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell said, Mr. President, I'm going to be here for 14 years. You may not be here after the next three, so... <clears throat> You know, and, and that's the whole thing. The president and Congress cannot make them subservient to the president and Congress. The, you know, the, all they have to do is wait till some people resign or retire and then try to replace them with people that'll be more complicit. But the bottom line is the Federal Reserve has proven itself to be strongly independent. And sometimes Federal Reserve Board members will do things differently than the president that named them the Reserve Board. And this is a good thing. This independence is important. Last but not least, with the exception of Benjamin Bernanke, most Federal Reserve Board Chairmen have been conservative, very careful about their use of monetary policy. Bernanke is the exception because of quantitative easing, one of the dumbest experiments ever done. It failed. It could have caused a much bigger problem. Thankfully, it did not. But the fact that they don't want to take big risks with the nation's money or the banking system actually shows that it's the more conservative policy in the sense of risk avoidance. Now, what's the conventional wisdom? What can we take away from over 80 years of activist fiscal policy and a century of monetary policy? Well, most economists don't agree on jack squat. Okay, there's some that say it should never be used at all. Some say they should always be used. Some say sparingly, some say one more than the other. However, in recent years, there's been kind of a consensus that's come out among a lot of economists from different schools that usually go by this notion. If the economy is experiencing any economic problem, first, check for evidence of self-regulation. If there is evidence the economy was self-correct, do not use any macro policy. Wait and see what will happen. When in doubt, don't. If experiencing inflation and there's evidence there won't be self-regulation, tight monetary policy will work. Use it. If the economy is experiencing a severe recession and there's no evidence the economy will self-regulate, expansionary fiscal policy is where to go. But in all things, use good judgment whether or not to use policy and which policy to use. Do not be frivolous. Do not be capricious. Do not be sloppy about the use of policy. Be deliberate. Be thoughtful. Don't be political. Just be deliberate, be thoughtful, and use good judgment. All right. Well, that just about does her. Wraps her up, as the man says here. Now, again, we're going to be dealing with some math problems related to monetary policy and money creation, but those are stuff that will be covered exclusively in class. If I manage to get some time, I may post a couple of videos walking through the example problems related to this, but this pretty much has wrapped up my series of videos for macroeconomics. I hope you all found these useful. I hope that this has helped supplement the lectures. Please, as always, send me an email or post feedback, and I thank you very much.